once you're into real estate you always want to be in real estate real estate has a, a love and charm of its own how much important is a finance department in an organization it is very important finance should be available to you the day you want it and it should not be an afterthought when you get stuck somewhere the way banking touches uh, the lives of so many businesses so many economies i don't think so any other you know business touches so many lives and economies uh, in that fashion coming to a consumer's point of view how can a consumer decide whether it's more feasible for him to buy or rent while the question of rent or buy has existed for quite some time and i personally think that at some stage you will have to buy the interest rates in the construction industry are more than the average compared to other industries why is that so Hello everyone welcome back to speaking real estate podcast today with us we have Mr Vaibhav Agarwal who has a wonderful experience of 20 years in the banking and finance industry and he is here to get me wonderful insights on how to do construction financing and various topics related to financing hi vaibhav so how are you how is the market according to you the market is in a very interesting uh, space right now we've had uh, good times for the last 3 uh, to 4 years now post the covid uh, in short lockdown uh, we've had massively good recovery across the country and uh, real estate is doing really uh, good i'm hoping that these times continue for a longer period uh, for us to keep enjoying the benefits of it you must be having a good knowledge about like multiple cities as well since you have done financing in various cities in india yeah i have been blessed to have good experience of financing across various uh, markets uh, starting from ncr to uh, chennai and uh, but you know major financing is across the top 8 10 cities of the country only i wish india had more metros uh, which could be developed as you know staying uh, spaces and you know places where you could have more office spaces and not crowd the existing 8 cities only and as well so i'll normally how we start is we get i want to know the education career of our guest then the career path and then the following podcast what was your education oh education so i did my entire education from bombay a uh, bcom uh, from medibai college and then chartered accountancy uh, you know was my uh, go to thing uh, i always wanted to be in the finance sector so god was kind i got the job uh my first job at uh, kotak securities followed by icici bank and then i have always been a banker uh since then uh 20 years of banking uh had a short stint with kotak securities followed by a very satisfying long stint with icici bank post which i moved to tata capital uh to look after the credit for construction finance and uh it has been a a very nice learning journey uh, for me So if you take my 20 years of career I started with mortgages and those were heady days from 2002 to 2008 um, we had we had a very uh, you know progressive period at that point of time the entire country's economy was doing rather well the real estate was uh, going through its boom and uh, we had a very lovely time working for ICICI because ICICI was in its massive uh, growth phase uh, then 2008 9 i moved to the corporate center and subsequently to uh, rural uh, financing more specifically in uh, microfinance sector which was a very different uh, learning experience and that is where i got to see uh, the real bharat you know outside of the metro cities and how people uh, make their livelihoods over there the way they stay the way they finance things the options available to them uh, so on and so forth uh, that bharat has also come a long way in the last uh, 10 plus years but once you're into real estate you always want to be uh, in real estate real estate has a, a love and charm of its own and uh, 2012 saw me back coming to uh, the real estate sector uh, back i say say bank was kind enough to you you know uh, give me an opportunity to move back from the rural sector and go to uh, develop a finance uh, segment and since then i have always been uh, a real estate developer finance structured finance person uh, who's been who's dedicated you know all is waking hours to understanding a real estate financing real estate and uh, just being a player in this real estate world you said you always wanted to do finance why finance uh i wouldn't say i always wanted to finance i said i always wanted to be part of the 
a business community, part of the business world. Uh, and uh, what what will give you the most experience would be banking because the way banking uh, touches uh, the lives of so many uh, businesses, so many economies. Uh, I don't think so any other uh, you know business touches so many lives and economies uh, in that fashion. So banking was just that go-to thing uh, you know which helped me uh, satisfy my desire to understand businesses the way money moves, the way, you know, people plan their futures and uh, the way, you know, it is executed once well planned. You pursued chartered accounting. How much weightage you would give it that pursuing that chartered accountant has helped you? In my case, uh, you know, chartered accountancy helped me a lot in getting my thought process uh, organized, uh, in educating me on the various uh, taxation laws, the accounting principles, the economics uh, aspects, the accounting aspects uh, a lot. But in my opinion, uh, you know, any structured education or any professional course will will give you a very structured thought process of understanding. Uh, and what you do with that education will be entirely up to you. Like take for instance, in the banking fraternity, I have seen so many engineers uh, become very successful. The engineering because, you know, uh, to my mind, uh, engineers get their thought process of a very structured, planned way of executing uh, various things. And that is the same knowledge that they apply to banking also. Uh, so, you know, essentially what you do with your formal education is entirely up to you and your interests uh, in that uh, area. How much important is a finance department in an organization? It is very important. I think, you know, no matter what business you're in, uh, you know, whether you're a, a developer or whether you're a jeweler or whether you run a finance company or whether you run a bank or whether you run a, a, a sweet mart shop or, a you know, a, a, you know any uh, kind of business, uh, I think uh, finance plays the most critical uh, role. Because if you've not planned your finances very well, then the chances that you will have trouble in future is very, very bright. Uh, I also want to split finance into two parts. You know, one is the, the accounting and finance part and the other is the cash flow and treasury part. Uh, we often confuse the two or, you know, let let one part deal with all of it. But I think cash flows and treasury are something that everybody should pay a lot more attention to and, and because that's a very specialized function which keeps all businesses going smoothly. Also, um, planning your finances uh, very well would would mean the difference between running a very successful uh, business versus a business that does not, you know, uh, have the same smooth flow and process if your finances are not very well planned. If there's a new age entrepreneur or a new startup, what is more preferable for that person, debt financing or equity financing? A new age entrepreneur, more preferable would be to go for equity financing. Uh, there are various uh, uh, financial instruments available in the market which can help uh, a new age entrepreneur achieve his financial goals uh, along with uh, along with the business that he has planned. However, it is very advisable whether you're a new age uh, entrepreneur or somebody who's running multiple projects at one time that as soon as you conceive your business plan or you have a new project coming up, to engage an advisor, a financial uh, person or a banker who will be then able to advise you at the very beginning on what are the right steps to be taken as in when you need finance. Engaging with a banker or a financial advisor need not necessarily mean that you avail financing that day, but it means that finance should be available to you the day you want it and it should not be an afterthought when, when you get stuck somewhere. Uh, so it is part of the planning process and you should uh, speak to a financial advisor stroke a banker to ensure that you know you have financing options available of the right kind at the right time with the right terms available to you. Coming to real estate, it's a reverse way like where what I've observed is like developers are always preferable with debt financing over equity financing. Why is it that way in this industry? One reason is uh, surely the availability. Uh, the number of players, whether it is 
uh, formal banks, whether it is uh, NBFCs or home finance companies, surely the number of players available for debt financing are more. And which is why debt financing is a more preferred way of getting your projects financed uh, in the market. However, now we are also seeing that the number of uh, alternate investment funds, AIFs as they are uh, popularly known, or private equity players are also stepping up into the market given uh, the boom that we are experiencing in the whole uh, macroeconomic India and especially in the real estate. And uh, a lot of uh, equity financing is also uh, visible now. Uh, so a, a developer with the right uh, pedigree uh, background with a relevantly good project, he will not face an issue getting either debt financing or you know uh, equity financing uh, in that regard. What is an AIF? Uh, AIF is an alternate investment fund. Um, uh, it is governed by SEBI and uh, they they ensure that uh, they provide uh, flexible capital for financing various aspects of real estate. How is it formed? Like who contributes to, to that fund? So uh, the formation of an AIF is uh, wherein you have an anchor uh, investor. Typically, uh, you know, uh, these are from large financing houses or business houses uh, who end up as a uh, anchor investor. And then they raise money from various uh, pension funds, ultra HNIs, or uh, foreign investors to you know have a, a kitty in place for financing of various real estate options. If there's a new developer entering the market and hasn't done any previous projects or anything and would like to start his real estate venture, according to you, what would be his best ways of financing the project? Oh, the if a person is entering anew, then it is highly advisable that he takes uh, either private equity or mess finance, uh, you know, to finance his project, but also keeps a careful eye out on what product is he bringing to the market, and uh, will the will the market accept the product that he's bringing in? Because sales also forms a very integral uh, part of the financing of that project. Also, since you mentioned that he's a new uh, entrepreneur, new developer, it is advisable that he take up a project. Uh, which which looks like within a striking range of being completed and not a rather largest project which which has a potential to get stuck for want of various uh, you know uh, capital requirements i would like to go and know the whole construction finance procedure we'll tackle step by step all the points in this whole process starting from uh, from an banker's eye or a financial institution's eye how do you analyze a project that whether should we go ahead and finance this project or not? I classify this as a classic uh, three-pillar process. What is the three-pillar process to my mind? The first analysis is done on the developer, the promoter, uh, in which we analyze what has he done, which markets he has worked into, what has been his borrowing history, what has been his de uh, delivery history, does he have any uh, litigation pending against him or the projects, what has his customer experience been, etc. Once we have satisfied ourselves with uh, the promoter background, and uh, then we uh, then we come to the next aspect, which is the project. Uh, the project is analyzed from all possible uh, angles. Uh, what is the macroeconomic scenario of the city in which you are financing it? What is the microeconomic view of the micro market in which you are financing? What is the demand and supply situation over there? When we started financing, access to data was very difficult. Today, we are in a blessed world where data availability is very easy. We have a plethora of institutions who have uh, organized the uh, data network so beautifully that you know all data, all uh, analysis is available at the uh, click of a button. Prop equity, prop stack, CRE matrix, laser for us, JLL, analog, all of these have organized data so beautifully that you know, you can analyze any particular micro market in detail before you go ahead with the financing of that project or not. Once we know about the micro market and what the micro market is typically known for, then we peg it against what is the product that the developer wants to bring to that market. Uh, because the product can make a world of a difference. If in a, if in a typical, you know, uh, affordable middle class market, you try and bring in a slightly larger inventory which may not be affordable to that market 
it might become a slow moving project or it might become a stuck project so you have to go along with the market and now in all cities each market is very well defined for the kind of clientele that it brings whether on the residential side or on the commercial uh, side once the market and the product uh, have been ticked okay uh, then one looks at the various approval matrices that are available uh, one looks at what is the current stage of construction what are the uh, what is the pending cost uh, available what is the equity that the developer has brought in uh, into the project and what is the dependence that will be there on the sales uh, collection uh, once the project is financed by the relevant uh, lender the third pillar uh, to our mind is the financing of that project you have to ensure that the project is financed adequately uh, any lesser finance would mean that you will get stuck at some stage uh, you know sooner or later so a project should be adequately financed from day one not only on the amount but also on the tenure a uh, typical mistake that i have seen uh, that you know a lot of people or a lot of players do is that they take a lower tenure finance even if they are going for a high rise building and that is classically where the moratorium runs out and your repayment starts but your building is incomplete so financing the project right with the right terms and conditions is equally very critical when i say financing the project right it would mean not only having the right loan amount but also having the right moratorium and repayment schedule and the right terms wherein you can disburse the loan facility in layers to match the developer's construction uh, plan that he has put in place moratorium period is the period where the developer has to only pay the interest amount and it's okay if he doesn't do the repayment so moratorium period is the period where the developer has to pay the interest amount this is true for banks nbfcs and hfcs um wherein you have monthly servicing of the debt on the interest component and post the moratorium period your formal repayment starts of course what helps today is also the entire escrow mechanism and the uh, prepayment happening out of the escrow mechanism in a, in a manner in which both the project also reaches the completion and the lender is also prepaid uh, adequately we were looking at all the good sides that we have to look at for passing or approving of the loan for a project what would be the red flags that you would look at like if this things there it's immediate rejection of that loan we encourage all developers to plan uh, ahead uh, i think you know the two critical elements uh, for any business is passion and planning uh, if you don't plan adequately if you don't make provisions for any um, and all future events to happen you will end up in a space where you don't want to be in uh, for so one thing that as a lender i never encourage is uh, change of plans midway that is a classic way to delay your project whatever your plans are you should try and freeze them on day 1 and get maximum approvals as much as is possible on day 1 if however there is a regulatory need to change your plans then one may but then it should be immediately known to your lender also and you should work in a manner in which you don't get stuck because of that change of plan and the ensuing delay that comes along with the change of plan what advice would you give for a developer to prevent such things from happening maybe hire an advisor or no i think you know today's uh, developers are very cautious uh, introduction of rera has also brought a lot of sanity uh, to the entire process uh, introduction of rera has gotten everybody who was lesser organized or more organized to be fully organized and meet a standard requirement criteria of the rera that is implemented in each state um i think you know the only thing that is uh, that will always remain is how well you plan uh, for your project and for the future you have to estimate all aspects of the project uh, not only finance but also approvals but also availability of supply chain customer sentiments sales collection delays in collections from customers you know a delay in receipt of material uh, in case you know things happen you have to plan uh, adequately in advance and ensure that you deliver uh, a project which not only satisfied 
the customer and other stakeholders, but also is satisfying for the developer when you reach uh, the end of the project. So moving on, like uh, there's a project and the background research has been done and may the financial institution and banks come to a conclusion that's, that this loan can be moved ahead. What would be the compliance required to go forward and maybe take the steps ahead for disbursements? So once the approval is received from a financial institution for availing a fund, it's a pretty well-defined uh, process on signing the loan documents, ensuring that your project is mortgaged along with the other terms and conditions that are specified, adequately specified uh, in the term sheet. The regulator has also been very vocal uh, about you know, specification of various terms in the term sheet. And if you see the last speech by the RBI governor also, he's been very categorical in saying that the terms have to be adequately explained to the customer and made clear. So most of the good financiers now ensure huge transparency and go as per the laid down processes uh, for disbursement of the project. You touched upon a very significant word called compliances. Now, it's a very wide term. It is not only restricted to uh, compliance for a financial facility. I think today's world just has gone uh, very high on that term of compliances. And every department that you deal with, whether it is the government authorities, whether it is the taxation authorities, whether it is the lenders, you have to have a very high degree of compliances. In fact, most of the good uh, you know, businesses, and I'm, and I'm going beyond developers, have a team, you know, depending on the size of their business, which is dedicated to only compliances. They ensure that they plan their compliances. They ensure that you know, they have a calendar uh, of compliances ready and uh, all the compliances are done within the specified uh, time frame. And, you know, as, as the world becomes more organized, any non-compliance, uh, the penalty and the associated, uh, you know, rework for it is just too high. So it is always advisable to get it right the first time and ensure that your compliances are perfect. There's a redevelopment project and let's say the value of that project is 100 crores. Obviously, the developer can't get a loan for 100 crores, including all the cost, approval cost, acquisition cost, and the construction cost. How much can he borrow from a bank? There is no thumb rule uh, per se, you know, for defining what is the right amount uh, to, you know, borrow from a bank for a project of any size. But the typical thumb rule that uh, the chartered accountant fraternity and, and acceptable in the financial world is, having a debt equity ratio of 1 is to 3 or 1 is to 2 or 1 is to 3. Uh, that is the right uh, debt equity ratio to have. One should also ensure, as a lender, we have always ensured that there is enough uh, equity in the project from the developer's end so that, you know, there Interest is enough... Interest is secured. Uh, it's, it's secured for everybody, for all stakeholders. Not only the financier, but also, you know, uh, for the developer per se also. The redevelopment project is of 100 crores. How much could he so if lend from? Is like cost, even if he, uh, if, he, if hundred crores is the cost of the project, uh, we typically say that the equity should be in the region of twenty to twenty-five crores, and the debt could be in the region of forty to forty-five crores. That is a classic two is to one debt equity uh, ratio, which ensures a comfortable, uh, you know, financing for the project and running of the project also. And at what intervals can the developer get that disbursement? Like. He can't get the disbursement immediately at any stage of the project. Okay. So, um, as per the current regulations in place, uh, once the once all the approvals uh, are in place, does one go ahead and disburse the facility? The various tranches of disbursement are decided mutually between the lender and the borrower uh, before it goes to the committee for uh, approval. Uh, the tranches are in a manner in which that the cash flow deficit that is there at that particular stage of funding is met adequately from the financer and the project continues to progress at the relevant uh, speed that has been pre-planned uh, for the project. You also said that um, the entire money is not available at the beginning of the project. 
the entire money is not required to be availed at the beginning of the project. As the project progresses, one purchases various material or makes payment to the authorities or makes payment for the laborers, etc. And that is how one should draw down the money. Because see, it is not free money. You have to incur a cost on it. There is an interest that needs to be paid on it. So one should draw the money only at the right time when you need to make the payment so that your cost incurred is optimized to that uh, extent. Um, if, if full money is required at the beginning, uh, then only two products uh, which are lease rental discounting uh, on a lease rental discounting on a completed property and uh, inventory finance which again is on uh, near complete or completed property which is where you can avail the full money at the beginning of the uh, at the beginning of the facility itself so normally a huge amount of the project is invested before the construction starts the approval cost as well as the land acquisition cost if it's there in a greenfield project is there any way for a developer to get ac access to funds for funding of land acquisition and approval cost many eifs are and private equity players are available in the market who do uh, acquisition for uh, you know uh, land acquisition funding mm. as per the current uh, as per the current regulation in place for banks and nbfcs we are not permitted to finance acquisition of land but Solutions are available with private equity players and alternate investment funds to avail land financing. Okay, coming to another topic. The interest rates in the construction industry are way above more than the average compared to other industries. Why is that so? All right. Okay. So the perceived risk of doing project finance has always been higher. In fact, world over, all regulators classify this as a high-risk financing business. Surely because of the fact that it is it is a long-term loan, uh, it will at least be in the region of three to seven years. And uh, it is also fraught with various, um, you know, uncertainties. Uncertainties could be on uh, account of, you know, the approvals that are received over a period of time, how the markets will behave over a period of time, uh, how the customer will end up buying over a period of time or the cash flows. So, you know, you are you are pegging it in the future and such financing world over is slightly more expensive than what we see on an average, uh, you know, for other industries. So, conclusion, it is mainly because of the higher amount of risk that is there in this industry. If there is a recognized player or a developer who has uh, proved his work over a good amount of period of time, is there a chance that he would get some benefit out of goodwill or his previous performance? Maybe a slightly lower interest rates. Yes. So see, uh, project finance or construction finance is available from anywhere between, you know, 9% today to, uh, you know, 18% plus, depending on the profile of the developer and the stage of the project that one is aiming to uh, get financed. And um, various developers, depending on their uh, previous track records, command certain rates of interest and they negotiate with the lender for that relevant rate of interest to be applicable again. Rate of interest also is um, a function of demand and supply. Like if you see uh, from the period of 2017, 18 to 2020, availability of finance was lower and hence rates were also higher. Uh, but, you know, post-COVID, once the markets revived and real estate picked up really well, the availability of number of lenders has gone higher. And which is why interest rates have slightly tempered down uh, over here. So it is also a function of, you know, a classic function of demand and supply. How much is right now the preferable interest rate available to the mass for developers? So there is no thumb rule for it. But uh, one is easily, if one has the right pedigree, one is able to get uh, financing anywhere between 12 to 16%. Well, depending 16. on the stage of project and the pedigree of the developer. Coming to repayment of the loan. So one thing is like how to decide the tenure because there might be cases that sales are done at a initial stage and developer has got the source of funds through sales and he has taken up the loan as well. So he can do the repayment at a very initial stage maybe in few months is that fine? So all lenders permit 
repayment of the facility from sales uh, earlier than they're scheduled. And uh, most of the lenders don't ask for any uh, foreclosure or prepayment charges in such a scenario where the project has sold much better than what was uh, forecasted for the project. Uh, prepaying a facility when excess funds are available is the most prudent thing to do. Uh, and lenders always welcome uh, repayment of the facility prior to the schedule date if you have had very good sales. How is the period decide? Like, should the loan be for three years or seven years? Who plays a ma- more deciding role, the developer or the bank? Uh, both of them. Uh, because see, uh, one has to decide the moratorium period of the facility and the repayment period of the facility depending on the height of the building or depending on the size of the project. Um, in in Bombay, in Delhi, you're seeing high-rises come up. Giving them a shorter moratorium period or a shorter full loan tenure would be unwelcome because you know you would not you would not have reached near completion stage of the project and your repayment would have commenced. And similarly, when you go to other markets like Pune, Hyderabad, uh, one sees that projects are spread out over a large area. So they might the buildings might not be tall, but the amount of construction that is there is is pretty large. So the tenure of the project should be decided between the lender and the developer in consultation with each other in a manner in which uh, we are able to match the construction of the project and the repayment of the facility adequately. Can we take up a case study in your experience that this was the size of the project, this was the loan amount, this was the term for that loan? So I financed a project uh, in Hyderabad which had a total sellable area of 3.6 million square feet. 36 lakhs 36 feet. lakh square feet. Now, it's a huge project. We don't even see such large uh, construction projects uh, frequently in Bombay. Uh, in that, we, we, you know, we negotiated with the developer and between us, we were able to come to a stage wherein we split the project into three phases. Because the developer was also not going to develop the entire 36 lakhs in one go. There was a set of buildings that he did in phase one. So we ended up financing for that. Then at the relevant point of time when he was starting his phase two, we did the finance for that. And then the phase three as and when it started. This also ensured that uh, phase one, two, three, which were already there with us as a lender, was financed at the right time for the right amounts. And each phase had its own independent moratorium and own independent repayment so that it did not become a burden on the future or past phases to come. How long was that term? So for each of the phases, we did a five-year financing because these were all 22-storied towers. Uh, So keeping in mind, you know, the structure, the number of buildings, we decided to do a four to five-year structure for each of the phases and it was adequately financed and the developer was able to deliver the project on time. Going back a little bit, uh, to the compliance part, do they differ from a BMC redevelopment to an SRA project to maybe some other project in some other city? Oh, yes. Uh, So real estate is a very local area subject, if I may use that term. The methodology and the number of approvals varies from each city to city. Uh, It varies from each market to market. Like take, for instance, MMR. Now, MMR is comprises of so many uh, complications. We have BMC for a certain area. Then we have Mira Road behind the Municipal Corporation. Then we have Vasai Virar Municipal Corporation. Then over there, we have Thane Municipal Corporation and so on and so forth. We also have other uh, parameters involved in Bombay like MMRDA on one section, the Connectors Land on another section, the BMC on one section, the uh, SRA on one section. So it is, you know, the the number of approvals, the timing of approvals varies from each section to section. And similar is the case when you go to other cities also. So the number of approvals and compliances required in each of these cities varies dramatically. Does these compliances affect the term of the loan, the interest rates of the project or anything? Not really. Uh, but we do build in time for the relevant approvals to come in, especially the major approvals, uh, you know, to come in. Uh, but essentially, the rate of interest is dependent on the pedigree of the developer and the project stage 
that he's wanting to you know bring to the finance uh, company so what if someone defaults on the loan and is not able to repay the loan oh defaults um uh, have you experienced that oh yes uh defaults are infrequent in the industry if you do your credit underwriting specifically however having said that defaults do occur for a variety of reasons the most frequent form of defaults that we have seen is typically uh diversion of funds and non disclosure of various critical uh, information in this regard uh defaults also occur if there is a stop work notice or some approval which is made unavailable at some point of time uh in the project most of the times we've been able to avoid defaults if the developer works along with the lender to avoid a sticky situation but wherein flow of information is inadequate we have seen uh you know ugly surprises happen and defaults come into play defaults are known defaults uh often pose multiple sets of problems to all stakeholders involved not only the developer but also the lender but also the suppliers but also the government institutions but also the customer uh and it becomes very challenging in a project to resolve uh such defaults more often than not we have seen that uh defaults in early stages are much easier to resolve with some external help but as defaults become very old it it ensures that there is a loss that occurs to all the stakeholders uh involved and that starts with the developer himself defaults also don't occur in a day uh the decay starts slowly and there is no better person to identify the decay than the developer himself it is my suggestion that the minute you see some difficulties arising in your project you should approach your lender and take the project forward in a more consultative fashion rather than hide that information from your lender uh to happen like i said the dk starts with a very small uh instance and then keeps growing till the time you actually default the time available from the day the dk starts to the actual default is pretty large and a lot can be done to avoid such a situation and uh, ensure that the a uh, default does not happen or if it happens how all stakeholders can come out of it faster with the most minimal loss possible a major reason would be diversing the funds of the project one of the reasons of a default is also diversion of funds um other reasons being inadequate disclosure of information how does one diverse its funds oh you know if if your intent is not clear see intent plays a very big role in any project if your intent is not clear then avenues are plenty having said that um uh, rera has brought a lot of discipline to to this field and we see uh, the number of such instances coming down dramatically and it is good for the industry because this is one of the largest uh, industries in any country and uh with the space that india is in right now uh rera has helped the cause of uh, ensuring lower defaults lower projects getting stuck and lower people incurring a loss does the lender keep an eye on the move of the money of the developers so again rera is uh you know uh, to be given the credit uh, for it um the rera institution work along with the lenders to ensure that there is an escrow mechanism all monies coming into the project from the customer are routed through a specific uh, rera account and it is easier for uh, the developer for the government authorities as well as the lender to monitor the inflow of the funds from there the lenders also ensure that they do timely monitoring of the projects to ensure the terms and conditions agreed to between the borrower the developer and the financier are met from time to time understood the whole construction finance from approval to repayment and what if someone defaults on the loan coming to equity financing i haven't had any experience or haven't went through any case studies but how does equity financing actually work 
is like they became a become a partner in the company or they buy the stock of the project so multiple forms of uh, private equity stroke eif uh, are available in the market um typically they don't become partners uh, in a company unless there is a specific platform that is being carved out for it mm, most of the private equity funding is in the form of a mes9 debt which has a particular moratorium period however here it is easier on the cash flows because uh, in the instance of a, a private equity or an ai funding uh, moratorium is an actual moratorium without repayments of interest and subsequently uh, you know when the repayment starts both the interest and principal are repayable uh, jointly uh, in those accounts uh, there are structures available wherein they buy uh, you know inventory uh you know at a specific rate uh or and wherein they come in at the stage of uh the acquisition of land itself uh with the developer coming to a consumer's point of view how can a consumer decide whether it's more feasible for him to buy or rent again you know we'll come to the topic of cash flows each individual household knows his or her cash flows and with with a certain degree of um you know surety they can predict their cash flow for the next uh, couple of years depending on the availability of the free cash flow they should decide whether they want to rent or buy while renting while the question of rent or buy has existed for quite some time and there is a lot of debate that has happened on uh, rent versus buy i personally think that at some stage you will have to buy and get out of the rented property renting is uh, to my mind an intermediate stage wherein uh, you know you move to a city and uh, you know you just don't have enough cash flows at that point of time to enter into a buy agreement at that point of time you rent and then subsequently when your your personal finances support you to buy a property you end up definitely buying a property if a company can borrow money is there a limit to its borrowing capacity not really there is no limit to the borrowing capacity uh it is a negotiated amount between the lender and the borrower of the money that is made available to them however like i said before uh, a classic debt equity of uh 2 is to 1 or 3 is to 1 is most recommended uh, so that there is enough equity uh, in the company to take care of unforeseen uh, circumstances uh, and that's a comfortable debt equity ratio to have if someone wants to move to the ratio of 1 is to 5 or more he can do it he can do it if he finds a willing lender is there a capacity for the bank to lend like i said if the lender is willing to go beyond the comfortable debt equity ratio of 2:1 uh, or 3:1 they can talking from the overall perspective not sticking to one developer like uh, like how much finance is available for everyone is there a capacity for the bank oh no there is enough money available in the system um there are enough uh, financial institutions uh private equity players out there in the market uh you know to finance the risk that they deem fit uh and i don't think so uh, availability of finance is a challenge uh, given the current macroeconomic situation of india and uh, i have seen uh there is enough domestic money and there is enough foreign capital also available to the relevant players and projects in india you had mentioned that you have done financing for the rural india for a few years how does that work oh rural india is fascinating they have very ingenious methods of uh, working they they are able to conduct uh, their affairs and businesses uh, in spite of the various challenges uh, that that are there in their space um it has been uh, the initiative of the regulator to have more banking channels more formal financer available to rural india uh, from time to time and the regulator encourages having branches uh, for wa- for all banks in uh, the hetero to unbanked or the lower banked areas uh, as well um i was associated with uh, farmer financing and microfinancing institutions uh, at some point of time and uh, it was endearing to see how quickly uh, rural india was able to grasp the concept uh and make use of that available financing for various aspects of their 
uh, business. Financing to Root in India has always been available, uh, you know, uh, post independence, uh, with the regulator pushing all the banks, uh, you know, led by SBI to open branches in the unbanked, lower banked areas. But today, uh, when one goes to uh, the hinterlands of the country, uh, one is very happy to see all private sector players, uh, you know, and other specialized players uh, make themselves available for financing various aspects in uh, the rural parts of the country. Is there much opportunity for players to enter the rural market? Oh, there is the opportunity uh, to enter the rural markets is huge. Uh, surely because of two things that uh, there is a sizable population of India that continues to uh, live and thrive uh, in the rural uh, spaces uh, and also the available uh, you know, business opportunity for the financer is also uh, very good. We see uh, rural India do very well on uh, two-wheeler financing or tractor financing or various uh, forms of agri and farmer financing. Uh, microfinance is a prevalent uh, practice across the country and microfinance has helped the country a lot uh, over a period of time. What are LRDs? LRDs, the short form of uh, lease rental discountings. LRDs are typically wherein uh, you own a uh, space, uh, a commercial or a retail uh, commercial space that you have leased out uh, to another business and they pay a monthly lease or a rental uh, on that count. These agreements are typically for longer periods, uh, you know, ranging from uh, 3 years to 15 years or so. Uh, but the most typical form of, uh, most typical period for these LRDs is 9 years. So, uh, being an assured cash flow uh, that is there, uh, banks have a product, uh, banks and NBFCs have a product called lease rent and discounting, wherein they discount the future cash flows against the security of that asset and provide you the money for other business purposes. Of course, it comes with certain restrictions that the regulator has specified, wherein you cannot use that money uh, for a, a small list of things. Uh, which has to be observed when availing a lease rental discounting facility also. Is the period defined 9 years or more than that? If the developer wants to repay it before that, can he do that? So again, this is a bilateral uh, discussion between a lender and a borrower and the terms that have been agreed to at the time of availing a, a lease rental discounting. And typically, uh, you know, uh, if uh, typically lenders uh, do not hesitate in accepting a repayment if it is coming out of excess uh, business surplus or cash flows of the group uh, per se. Only in instances wherein uh, the facility is being taken over, the lender may choose to uh, enforce or charge a prepayment or a foreclosure charge depending on the terms that have been agreed to while availing the facility. So you had a long journey of 20 years in the finance industry. What would be your key learnings Planning and passion are the two main key ingredients for any business uh, that one runs. If you don't plan enough, then probably you are planning to fail. So you need to plan every aspect of your business in advance. Uh, the second is passion. If you don't have the passion for the business, you know, you will not bring the required energies uh, to the business, to all the stakeholders. So you have to have enough and more passion to run your business. Because when you're running a business, you will have good days and you'll have the not so good days. Uh, you'll have unforeseen circumstances or times. You'll have very heady times. Your passion is the element that will keep you going very well during uh, these times. If there is a young guy who wants to enter the finance industries, what are the options he can have? A young person wanting to enter into the finance industry should first check whether he wants to be a part of the financial world, whether it is whether he has his heart and mind uh, in this space. You're most welcome because uh, to enter the finance industry. You're most welcome to enter the finance industry because you know with the country growing in all aspects, there is re there is requirement for good talent uh, at all all spheres of life. I'll add something to the planning aspect. As part of planning, one has to be very careful with the capital. When I say capital, I not only mean money as a capital, 
I also mean other resources, especially human resources, uh, to be planned in advance. Capital is scarce uh, and we should plan usage of that capital adequately to ensure that we can achieve the best output from the available resources that we have. Which of the projects are your most memorable ones? Oh, it has been 10 years that I've been financing projects and uh, there are quite a few uh, projects that are my most memorable projects. Uh, the first project that I financed was a project called Ajmera Regalia, uh, a single standalone building, uh, and that has been one of the most uh, memorable projects. Besides that, there have been plenty, uh, you know, plenty of projects where you've put so much of uh, you've put so much of attention and emotion in it that they automatically become a part of your uh, long-term memory. Uh, Ace Divino was one such project in NCR. Uh, Siddha Sky in Kolkata was a, was another dream project. Uh, Anukampa Sky Terraces in Jaipur was another uh, you know project that I remember very well. Uh, Aryant Vihana in Chennai, again KLP Abhinandan, one project in Chennai, uh, was a memorable uh, project. Uh, Arc uh, Voyage to the Stars in Pune was another memorable project. Runal Gateway in Pune again was one uh, memorable uh, project. Mm, uh, Samrat Apnagar in Nasik was a memorable uh, project for me. Um, Vasavi Urban, the project that we spoke about in Hyderabad being 36 lakh square feet of uh, selling area was another memorable uh, project for me. 63 GMA, the project that we are sitting in, was also a project, uh, you know, which had its own set of twists and turns and is another project which is close to my heart. Uh, there have been many. Uh, TW Gardens in Kandivili and done by Vadva is another project that I uh, remember very distinctly. One of the projects that we financed immediately post uh, the COVID lockdown opened up and it is now nearing completion. So a lot of uh, memorable projects uh, along the way. On financing, I'll speak a line. Financing um, is a very thoughtfully done uh, activity and I say that financing should have a view on all three aspects the past the present and the future the past comes with a lot of hindsight and learnings that you've had from your and the system's previous uh, experiences the present uh, which is you know with all the uh, macro and microeconomic data uh, that is available to you in the form of insights uh, should contribute to your decision-making process and the future, uh, uh, which is foresight, uh, is again that one should be able to predict with a certain degree of accuracy before you take decision onto any financing aspect or while taking another while undertaking any other project at hand. Any parting note you would like to give? India is truly shining. Right now, we see uh, all industries perform very well uh, in the recent past. And the macroeconomic forecast for the country is very good. I think uh, for all entrepreneurs, not only uh, from the developer fraternity, but also from all the other ancillary and other industries, it is a good time to be in India right now and be able to uh, capitalize on the opportunities available to us and take it to the next level. This will not only help us progress, but it will help the country uh, progress to the next level. Thank you so much for giving out your time and insights and helping me learn more about real estate financing, especially the construction financing part. Hoping to have you soon again here and learn more from you. Thank you so Wish much. Wish you all the very best, Krish. Uh, it's a very good initiative that you've taken in speaking real estate and uh, we wish you all the best to continue for a long and a successful stint on this podcast. Thank you.